Hi everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Carlisle, Ohio was home to many families, including the Richardsons. The Richardson family consisted of Kim and Scott Richardson, who were both actively involved in their children's lives. Their son, Jackson, was passionate about playing football, while their daughter, Brooke Schuyler, or Schuyler as she was known, was a cheerleader. Schuyler suffered from an eating disorder that ruled her life from a young age. Her mother, Kim, first noticed her daughter's struggle with her eating habits when she was in the sixth grade. At just 12 years old, Schuyler's obsession with food and exercise became apparent when she refused to purchase gum if it had more than five calories. Because Schuyler was a flyer on the cheerleading squad, she needed to be light and easy to toss. This pressure to maintain a certain weight made her battle even harder. She had become consumed by her body image and the constant fear of gaining weight. Schuyler's struggle with her weight and body image began during cheerleading season. In an effort to maintain her body weight, she started throwing up after meals. However, this destructive behavior only exacerbated her issues when cheerleading season was over. After the end of cheerleading season, Schuyler's struggle with her weight intensified. She would experience periods of binge eating, where she would consume excessive amounts of food in a short period. These episodes would often be followed by periods of starvation, where Schuyler would restrict her food intake or engage in extreme diets. Schuyler's parents noticed her changing behavior and were concerned for her well-being. They tried to approach her about their concerns, but Schuyler would shut down whenever the topic was raised. She never wanted to talk about it, and any attempt to address her weight was met with resistance. Frustrated, Schuyler's parents sought professional help from various doctors and therapists. They hoped that these interventions would provide some relief for their daughter. After an evaluation, Schuyler was eventually diagnosed with body dysmorphia. This condition involves an obsessive focus on a perceived flaw in appearance, often leading to significant distress and impairment in daily functioning. July 2016 marked the summer before Schuyler's senior year when she decided to begin dating a friend's cousin. However, the relationship did not last for long, and by January 2017, Schuyler had moved on to a new boyfriend, a high school student named Brandon. Schuyler was genuinely happy and seemed to be gaining weight. Her parents, Kim and Scott, hoped that their daughter's eating disorder was under control. They noticed that she looked healthy and appeared genuinely happy. In February, Schuyler excitedly picked out her prom dress. It was a tightly fitted dress that required her to be laced into it. By mid-March, Schuyler went on vacation with her family. During the trip, she wore a two-piece bathing suit. Her mom thought she looked wonderful. Kim, knowing that her daughter and Brandon were heating up, wanted Schuyler to start taking birth control pills. She believed that this would protect her daughter's health and help prevent any unwanted pregnancies. In mid-April 2017, Schuyler visited her mother's gynecologist to obtain a prescription for birth control. Schuyler's mother, Kim, waited outside the doctor's office while Schuyler met with the doctor. Upon exiting the examination room, Schuyler emerged with tears streaming down her face. Kim immediately asked her daughter why she was so upset, to which Schuyler replied that it was a traumatic experience for her. She believed her daughter was telling the truth unaware of the real reason behind the tears. The truth was that during Schuyler's visit to the OBGYN, the doctor informed her that she was approximately eight months pregnant. Schuyler requested the doctor not to tell anyone about this, as she was not ready to share the news with her loved ones. Nine days later on May 5th, Schuyler and her boyfriend, Brandon, went to the prom. Despite her advanced pregnancy, Schuyler managed to fit into her prom gown. Two months after Schuyler went to prom on July 14, 2017, the Carlisle police showed up at the Richardson home. They informed Schuyler's parents, Kim and Scott, that they needed to speak to the teenager about something she may have witnessed. The police officers assured the parents that Schuyler was not in trouble and took her at their word. Scott decided to drive Schuyler to the police station, unsure of what awaited them. The police wanted to question Schuyler regarding a call they received from a gynecologist's office. This OBGYN reported that one of their patients had given birth to a baby and buried the baby in the backyard. Upon receiving this information, 
the police promptly took Skylar into custody and brought her to an interrogation room. Skylar's father was not allowed in the room with her. Before initiating the interview, the police read Skylar her rights. They then proceeded to disclose the details of the call from the doctor's office. According to the caller, the doctor had informed them that on April 26th, Skylar had discovered that she was pregnant. However, when Skylar returned to the office, she reportedly disclosed that the baby was not alive, and she buried her in the backyard. During her interview, Skylar admitted to the police that she had given birth to a stillborn baby girl on May 7, 2017. Skylar stated that she had delivered the baby in the bathroom and noticed that the infant was not breathing and had no heartbeat. She explained that she felt the need to bury the baby and decided not to tell anyone about the incident. According to Skylar, she silently walked downstairs and retrieved a small garden shovel. She then dug a shallow grave in her backyard, where she buried the baby. To mark the spot and the memory of her child, Skylar placed a vase with a flower in it at the burial site. After questioning Skylar, the police informed her parents, Kim and Scott, about the real reason she had been brought to the station. Kim and Scott were shocked to learn that she had been pregnant, as they had no idea. They saw her every day and believed that she was unaware of her pregnancy. Upon hearing the news, Kim was heartbroken to discover that her daughter had faced this difficult situation alone. She expressed her sorrow at the fact that Skylar had to deliver the baby in the bathroom without anyone there to support her. Skylar informed her parents that she had named the baby Annabelle and claimed that the child's father was a close friend's cousin whom she dated briefly before Brandon. Crime scene investigators arrived at the Richardson home to conduct a search for the baby's remains. During the search for the baby's remains in the Richardson backyard crime scene, investigators removed weeds and brushed the ground to uncover the skeletal remains. The police were meticulous in their approach, carefully removing any debris that could hinder their investigation. Despite the challenges posed by the overgrown vegetation, they were able to uncover a significant amount of evidence. After removing the weeds and brushing the ground, the police discovered several bones, including pieces of the skull. These remains were meticulously collected and placed in small body bags to preserve any evidence. The investigators took great care to ensure that the integrity of the bones was maintained. One investigator later testified that the remains smelled. Another investigator confessed that the bones were so small that it was difficult to determine if they were collecting rock or bone. The coroner confirmed the discovery of hair and very small fingernails, but no organs or other identifiable items. After more than five hours of questioning, Skylar and her parents were allowed to return home. However, six days after the incident, the police contacted Skylar and informed her that she needed to come back again. They assured her father, Scott, that she was not in trouble. However, during the interview with Skylar, the police informed her that they had received new damaging information from the coroner's office. They claimed they had discovered more about the story than what Skylar had initially shared. The medical examiner who analyzed the remains stated that there was evidence to suggest that the baby's bones may have been burned. Skylar was bewildered when confronted with the statement that the baby was burned. She adamantly denied setting a fire, stating that she would never harm her child. The police, however, remained determined to get Skylar to admit to killing her baby girl and burning her remains to hide the evidence. In an attempt to elicit an admission, the police suggested that perhaps Skylar had tried to cremate the baby in order to keep the ashes off the premises. This suggestion only further confused Skylar, who was adamant that she did not burn the baby. However, suddenly, Skylar changed her story and told police she did have a lighter and may have used it to try and cremate her baby's remains. Additionally, Skylar stated that there is a possibility that the baby was born alive, as she made a gurgle or a noise, and possibly even heard her cry at one point. Skylar admitted to holding the newborn too tight, which may have contributed to the baby's death. During the hour-long interrogation, the police gathered sufficient evidence to arrest Skylar on a charge of reckless homicide. Their theory was that Skylar suffocated the baby. After presenting the case to a grand jury, she was eventually indicted and arrested for aggravated murder, a charge that carries a mandatory life sentence in Ohio. 
Schuyler pleaded not guilty to the additional charges of voluntary manslaughter, abuse of a corpse, and danger to children at her arraignment. She spent the weekend in jail until her family was able to secure a $50,000 bond. Schuyler found herself at the center of a media firestorm following the tragic death of her child. From the moment her name emerged, the public judged and scrutinized everything she and her family did. The constant judgment and scrutiny took a toll on their well-being, leading them to retreat into the safety of their own home. However, the threats they received made it difficult for them even to step outside. Members of the public would take pictures of them, further fueling the frenzy and adding to the immense pressure they were under. The relentless public scrutiny became unbearable, engulfing every aspect of their lives. Despite her defense attorneys believing that Schuyler gave a false confession and that her infant death was not intentional, the prosecution remained steadfast in their approach. Despite mounting evidence contradicting their initial assessment, they pressed forward with their case. One of the key pieces of evidence in the prosecution's case was the initial report from the medical examiner, who stated that the remains had been burned. However, upon further examination, the medical examiner retracted her initial assessment. After carefully reviewing the baby's body, she declared that there was no evidence whatsoever of burning. Despite this new revelation, the prosecution's approach remained unchanged. They clung to Schuyler's admission that she had attempted to cremate the remains, even though the evidence contradicted their theory of a burned body. This approach highlighted the state's determination to secure a conviction, regardless of the evidence. Throughout this tumultuous period, Schuyler's family endured immense stress and fear. The public scrutiny and threats made their lives unbearable, and they struggled to navigate a world where every move they made was under the microscope. Schuyler's defense attorneys worked tirelessly as the trial approached to defend her against the charges. Schuyler's family was able to raise the 50000 bail amount to secure her release on bond. However, as a condition of her release, she was ordered to wear the ankle bracelet to monitor her whereabouts. As a result, Schuyler remained primarily confined to her home and avoided going out in public. She found herself isolated and preferred to spend most of her time with her family's dogs. Over 12 months, Schuyler's life took on a different path. Her plans to attend the University of Cincinnati were put on hold as she awaited trial for the murder of her baby. The charges were serious, and the defense filed a motion to move the trial to a different county. However, the request was denied, leaving Schuyler to continue facing the trial in the original jurisdiction. During this time, the weight of her circumstances weighed heavily on Schuyler. She grappled with the emotional and psychological impact of the allegations against her, as well as the isolation she felt from the outside world. Spending time with her dogs provided solace and a sense of comfort. It became her main companionship and support as she awaited her trial. Schuyler's family stood by her side throughout this difficult period, offering unwavering support and encouragement. They stood by her, believing in her innocence and hoping the truth would come to light. Despite the challenges she faced, Schuyler remained determined to fight for her freedom. In July 2019, the state approached Schuyler's defense attorney with an unexpected offer. The offer stated that if Schuyler pleaded guilty to the remaining charges, which carried a sentence of 15 years, the state would withdraw the charge of aggravated murder. Schuyler's parents were conflicted about this decision, and wondered if she should accept the plea deal. After carefully considering the offer, Schuyler decided to turn down the plea deal. This decision terrified her parents, who questioned if she made the right choice. However, they knew it was Schuyler's choice, not theirs. On September 3, 2019, Schuyler went on trial for the murder of her newborn baby girl. The state began its opening statements by presenting a text message that Schuyler had sent to her mother. In this message, she expressed how happy she was, stating that her belly had returned to its normal size. She added that she would never allow it to get like it was again. This message was sent just a few hours after Schuyler gave birth. I am literally speechless with how happy I am my belly is back, OMG, she texted her mother. The prosecution told the jury during the second day of Schuyler's trial. During the state's opening arguments, they alleged that Schuyler had sent more text messages to her mother and boyfriend 
less than 24 hours after she had killed her baby. These messages, according to the state, suggested that Skylar was thrilled about her baby's death and pointed to these texts as evidence that she played a role in the baby's death. In one message, Skylar texted her mom, I'm so excited for dinner to wear something cute. Yay, my belly is back now. I am taking this opportunity to make it amazing. This message was interpreted as an attempt to hide her guilt and excitement about not having a baby anymore. The state argued that Skylar's use of the words excited was indicative of her pleasure in the baby's death. Additionally, the state alleged that Skylar had sent a message to her boyfriend stating, Last night was like the worst ever, but I feel so much better this morning. I'm happy. According to the state, this message was proof that Skylar had felt relieved after the baby's death. The state asserted that Skylar had no intention whatsoever of ever having her baby. They admitted that they could not provide concrete proof that the baby was born alive. However, they presented evidence indicating that Skylar had confessed to it during an interview with the police when Skylar stated that she had heard the baby gurgle and cry. After discovering she was pregnant, the state alleged that Skylar conducted a search on the internet for how do I get rid of a baby? In addition, it was claimed that Skylar's mother, Kim, had informed Skylar that her life would come to an end if she became pregnant. This revelation reportedly instilled fear in Skylar. The prosecutor said she was determined to keep her secret. When she could conceal her daughter no longer, she took her daughter's life. On the third day of Skylar's trial, the doctor who performed the autopsy on her baby and ruled the cause of death as violent homicide took the stand to testify. However, the doctor stated that she was not able to determine whether the fractures she found on the skull of the baby occurred before or after the death of the baby. Instead, she made her opinion on the cause of the fractures based on statements made by Skyler during her police interrogation. Skyler's defense attorney challenged the doctor's findings, arguing that she may have suffered from confirmation bias. The attorney argued that the doctor had already formed an opinion and was unlikely to change it. During cross-examination, the doctor admitted that she never examined the remains of the deceased baby under a dissecting microscope. The defense attorney then asked the doctor if she consulted with an obstetrician. The doctor responded that she had not. Furthermore, the attorney asked if the doctor had looked at photos of the burial site or the backyard of Schuyler's residence. The doctor again stated that she had not. Another doctor, a fetal medicine specialist, testified in the afternoon portion of Schuyler's trial, mostly under examination by the prosecution. This doctor cast doubts on Schuyler's baby being stillborn, stating that all she had was one screening. Given the margin of error of fundal height measurements during the third trimester of pregnancy, which the doctor said are off 60% of the time, she was probably carrying a healthy baby. The doctor added that Skylar had admitted feeling her baby moving inside of her, and a deceased baby does not move. He also cast doubt on the reports from a doctor who filed a report for the defense that said Skylar's baby likely had growth issues. During cross-examination by Skylar's attorney, the doctor was asked if the prosecution was paying him. He replied that he was given an amount of $5,000 a day because that's what it costs the practice if they have a doctor who's not there. As the prosecution presented their case against Schuyler, shocking and heart-wrenching evidence unfolded in the courtroom. Among the various pieces of evidence shown, the most impactful were the pictures of the deceased baby's remains displayed on the television screen. These images left a lasting impact on Schuyler, as revealed by her reactions during the trial. When the pictures of her baby's remains appeared on screen, Schuyler's initial reaction was to stare straight ahead. She avoided looking at the photos, seemingly unable to bear the sight. Skylar's stoic demeanor contrasted with the previous day when she visibly trembled when the judge sat down before jury selection. When Skylar's defense attorneys presented their case, they argued that Skylar's life was far from perfect, even before the accusation of murder. They claimed that much of what the prosecution presented were half-truths, and argued that some of the texts presented in court were taken out of context. The defense argued that Schuyler's frequent use of such text language did not imply that she committed the heinous crime of murdering her daughter. 
The defense attorneys also emphasized Skylar's mental health struggles, specifically highlighting her battle with an eating disorder since she was 12 years old. They presented evidence indicating that Skylar regularly visited a psychologist and nutritionist to address her eating disorder. To support their claims, they showed the jury pictures of Skylar depicting her at various stages of weight and appearance. These pictures included images of her looking rail thin, as well as those where she appeared slightly heavier. According to her attorney, Skylar cradled the baby for hours while bleeding on the ground in the bathroom. They said despite her physical state, she remained steadfast in her commitment to comfort and care for the lifeless body. After enduring unimaginable pain, Skylar's attorneys said she made the decision to bury her baby in the backyard. Skylar's attorney explained to the court that Skylar had intended to notify her family about her upcoming pregnancy, but unfortunately, she never had the opportunity to do so. According to her doctor, Skylar was told that she would deliver a baby within eight to ten weeks. As a result, she assumed she would have enough time to attend the prom and graduate high school before addressing the situation with her mother, whom she knew would not be supportive. During the defense turn, an obstetrician testified that the baby was stillborn. The doctor argued that Skylar did not admit to cutting the cord, suggesting that it may have become detached before or during birth. The doctor also pointed out that Skylar's description of the baby's appearance was noteworthy, as she said the baby was really white. The obstetrician stated that this did not indicate a healthy newborn. He said in his experience, a newborn is usually a purple-ish color. Furthermore, the obstetrician noted that Skylar only gained 15 pounds throughout her pregnancy. He suggested that her eating disorder may have restricted the baby's development in the womb. This testimony aimed to cast doubt on the validity of Skylar's statements to the police regarding the baby's well-being. The defense's argument was that Skylar only told the police what she wanted to hear during the interrogation and that she did not witness or engage in any harmful behavior toward the baby. They aimed to cast doubt on the credibility of her testimony and suggest that other factors may have contributed to the baby's death. Skylar Richardson's trial lasted for one week before the jury was sent to deliberate. After just four hours, the jury returned with a verdict. They acquitted her of aggravated murder, involuntary manslaughter, and child endangerment. However, she was convicted of abuse of a corpse, a felony that carried up to one year in prison. The judge ordered her to be held in jail until her sentencing hearing. One day later, her sentencing hearing took place. Skylar apologized for her actions and acknowledged the gravity of what she had done. During Skylar's sentencing hearing, the judge did not spare any leniency when he admonished Skylar for her role in the tragic loss of her baby. The judge firmly believes that if Skylar had made better decisions throughout her pregnancy, her child would still be alive today. The judge's admonishment was stern and unwavering. He expressed his disappointment in Skylar's actions and made it clear that the choices she made had severe consequences. The judge emphasized that the decisions she made led to the death of her baby. After expressing his dissatisfaction with Skylar's actions, the judge handed down a sentence of three years probation for abuse of a corpse. This sentence served as a reminder that Skylar's actions were morally reprehensible and against the law. In November 2020, a judge granted a request from Skylar's attorneys to terminate her probation two years early. During the hearing, Skylar expressed her desire to return to a normal life and stated that she no longer required the supervision of a probation officer. The judge acknowledged her progress and agreed that there was no longer a need for the probation department's resources to be invested in her case. The judge emphasized that a sentence of probation is not designed solely as punishment or rehabilitation. Instead, it provides an opportunity for individuals to demonstrate why they should not be sentenced to prison. Since her acquittal, Skylar has taken full advantage of this opportunity. She has completed two semesters in college and has been working part-time at the law firm that represented her. Despite being acquitted, Skylar has faced challenges in finding additional employment. According to her attorneys, she has been rejected from various job opportunities due to her probationary status. Despite these setbacks, Skylar remains determined to pursue her career goals. She has expressed interest in attending law school and becoming a public defender.